there are uh, five things which I wrote up there that we'll be discussing throughout the conference. And if you have an inspiration from any of those themes or anything throughout the conference, there are two places you can share that <clears throat> because three of these things are interactive arts. You probably saw the table of arts and photographs and items out in that room right that I'm looking at. I don't know the name of that room. And, and across from that, so on that table it are white cards and pens in a basket. And as you are moving throughout the conference and you see something on the table or anything there inspires you in any way or in a spiritual way or in any way, I'm asking you to write down that word on the card with the pens that are there and leave it in the fold it because it's anonymous. We don't need to know who's writing what. And fold it and leave it in the basket and hopefully we'll be able to read some of those towards the end of the conference to see how, because that's what art's for. It's to be interacted with whether you think about it or not. You know, you go to a museum, you look at an art, you might have a feeling, but who are you going to talk to about? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. So that's what that's about. Then there's the inspiration tree, which is out in the Entrance, the entrance hall, and it's a paper tree, it's against the wall, and that's sort of the same idea. There are multicolored leaves in a basket and pens next to that tree. And again, throughout the conference, you can write a word or a doodle or, or just stick a leaf on the tree. And hopefully, it'll be there are 250 leaves, so I hope the tree will be full by uh, Sunday. And the third thing is also in that room across from the art table. It's a paper scroll. It's blank right now. There are colored pens there. And again, if for the for the adults that are studying the themes or the youth that are studying the themes, hopefully throughout the conference you will write a word or a doodle or whatever about whatever that theme might have inspired in you or what you think that's about. If it's not about a theme, that's okay too. Um, you know, the children just want to throw up and throw a star on there. That's fine with me. And hope, um, I'll be moving that scroll along throughout the two days and hopefully so that nobody's going to see the whole thing until the very end. We'll un unfurl it majestically on, on, <laughs> on Sunday. <hopefully. laughs> One more thing. And then I have things for the children and the youth, which I won't explain right now. And th those people know about it. And I will be moving around a lot throughout the conference to make sure things are happening or answer any questions or anything. And that's my shortened speech because I was going to talk for about an hour. I well, changed my mind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, they can, oh. you know, because people may want to take time or something, or you know. That's a very nice it's, suggestion, but that's that room is going to be used as a breakout. So oh, you know, I see. Be interrupted during that. All right. So I think it's now time for the teachers. Is that correct? Okay. We're going to get ready to send the young people off to their assigned areas. So we need to have the teachers up here. Um, is that correct? Yep. And so we will be able to divide them up. Uh, you just say what group you're taking. Just trying to get your attention. Okay, so let's start with the very young. The very young. Let's very young, I'm going to be teaching six and under. So far, I have my Raha and my son. <laughs> um, so we will be in the room right here. If parents in any way wants to come and look at them or stay, and there's a session ring that's available. So, I'm assuming I'm doing right now. 
facility. We're very pleased to be able to have it. It's Jamie uh, Monfro's uh, Service Learning Center School, and uh, we're just really excited to be able to be here. So, uh, we thank you very much. This room is not used to having over 50 people in it, so the air conditioning was having a little trouble uh, keeping up, but it should, it should uh, improve now. But with that being said, I think we're ready to move on, uh, and uh, I'd like to introduce to you uh, a jewelry board member that is uh, responsible for uh, Central and Northern Florida, and I'd like to welcome Willa Hancock. Thank you, Jeff. Hello. Hello. We lost all the under 50 year olds and it got real quiet. <laughs> It's like my house, like crazy all the time. Uh, I also would like to thank Jamie for opening up your wonderful school and all the parents and children who use this space for allowing us into your space. As soon as I walked in, I was kind of overwhelmed and feeling so blessed to be in this space because this space is an example of what we're going to talk about over the weekend is how do we decide that the culture that is based in busyness and racism and division and et cetera is not the culture that works for us. And we're gonna build something different. We're gonna build a community that's different than that. So to me, that's a counterculture movement. Even to be here, to spend our Saturday together of all different backgrounds, religious backgrounds and races and social economic, and decide we're gonna come here today and we're gonna talk about the fact that we believe that there's the ability to build something better than what we have, a lot better than what we have. And that we believe that people uh, are waiting, that they're hungry. This first prayer that was shared by this parent, yearning, was so beautiful, right? That people are yearning, this prayer is yearning to fill the space that uh, society has. As our old systems of uh, politics and division fall apart, you can see these falling apart around the world all the time. Uh, that gap that's created how do we use it to rebuild something that's healthy, like spiritually healthier, financially healthier, physically and mentally healthier for our community? And this is an example of one person uh, and a community getting together to try to do that, to say, we believe that 
the school system could be a little different. Maybe we could offer a different option. Maybe kids who wouldn't normally be together could be together. Maybe they could learn something from each other. Uh, and the way that it's done, which you'll hear more about later, um, is just such a beautiful example. So I'm so grateful to be here in this space. And basically, you know, what we're going to talk about with theme one is uh, Baha'u'llah's vision, which is just that as humans, so we're going to get like real deep first, we'll start real deep. Why are humans here? <laughs> what is our purpose in life? We'll start there. So if we believe that our purpose in life is to work on ourselves individually so that we can help build better communities, that's it, right? So it seems simple. It's a lifetime job. It will take you all stages of your life and then you won't even ever get there, by the way. Uh, and the communities won't ever get there either, but we'll build on what our ancestors gave us and then we'll get forward to the next set of people, something stronger than we have now. That's, the, that's our, our goal. And this little gap of our life, uh, we call it this twofold moral purpose, two things we're working on morally. One is to develop myself, my capacities, my qualities, my patience, my understanding of diversity, my communication skills, my uh, connection to spirituality. And that is a lot of work because a lot of times culture is sucking you in like gravity into other things, division, negativity, uh, separation. So what you're doing is playing offense instead of defense. You're actively saying, no, I'm going to do something else. I'm going to get up in the morning and I'm going to meditate. I'm going to not you know, participate in a lunch group with a bunch of coworkers who are complaining about each other. I won't do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to go into spaces that only have people that look like me. Even though that's what naturally might happen if I just go through my day, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do something different. I'm not going to think it's weird to incorporate arts into my day. I'm going to sing through the day. I'm going to ask other people to be joyful. I'm not going to think it's awkward to ask my friend who's struggling if they would want to pray with me because maybe they want to pray with me. And I'm going to let them tell me what that looks like for them. I'm not going to assume what it looks like for me. This is who I'm going to be. And hopefully in doing this, I'm going to rebuild society, just in that home even. So the culture of my house, I have a bunch of teenage boys. So my house always smells a lot. <laughs> and uh, it's very loud. And I have moments where I'm like, oh my God, I just wish it was clean. Cups and socks. Why? Why are there thousands of cups and socks everywhere in my house? But in three years, my house will be empty. Uh, so I've been trying to enjoy these moments when they're there. But I have the ability for my house to be like, we could never have dinner together. We could be really busy all the time. We could complain about our neighbors. We could complain about our jobs. We could complain about our school. We could argue with each other. We could do all of these things. Or we could decide that we want to be different, even in my own house. And it takes some diligence, spiritual discipline, once a week for us to try to have a family devotional. We sit down, we talk about what's happening. We process with each other what our week looks like. We pray together. We set goals for the next week together. Some weeks we're better than others at doing it. But when we do that, the culture of my home changes. It shifts different. When I listen to my children, they don't have to yell so much because they don't feel like they're hurt because we've created a space where I'm asking for the voice because I want to hear the voice. And so I think that's just one example. And then I wonder, how do I do that in my neighborhood? My neighbors who come home and shut the garage and shut the door and don't know each other, right? How do I do that in my neighborhood? How do I start to say, I want to actually know you? And what I have found is all the fears I have in my head that no one else wants to do that, they don't want to hear from me, they don't want to talk about deep spiritual things, are all incorrect as soon as I do it. As soon as I do it, someone says, I meet my neighbor who is from the Philippines, and she's been here since the pandemic because she came to help with her grandchild right before the pandemic, and then she's been nervous to travel home or get stuck somewhere. And she doesn't speak good English, and she's home by herself every day. And when I went over to introduce myself to her, she cried. This is what really happens, not what's in my head, that no one wants to hear from me or whatever, and that might happen too, but, and so we stood in the driveway and we talked about her life and what she's experiencing and, you know, whatever, and when I went to leave, she held my hands, and this might be like a language thing, but I loved it. She said, I miss you already. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. 
<laughs> I miss you all when you do. What if humanity was like that? That when I'm not with you, I miss you all then. My neighbor, I miss you all then. So I went over last week and I talked to her about there's an election in the Philippines. What is she thinking? Does she worry about her family? Do we want to play together? So we've decided to be neighbors in a different way than society tells us to be neighbors. Because why? Because I don't believe in what society is trying to tell us to do. So we're doing these in our lives every day. So we're here today. And some of the ways that Baha'is are trying to do this is through things that are based in the creative word. Now, I teach a lot of children's class. So the creative word, the word from God, we talk, it, we talk about that it's creative with a capital C. It's not something I can create myself. It's a capital C. So in me, it can create a new me, and it can create a new community. I can't do it on my own, but I have this creative word throughout history that is so powerful. And by the way, it's so similar that it has this truth in it that if I use it, it creates something different. It changes something in me. And I believe in that more than I believe in myself and in my own ability to do something. So um, who are we? I think we need to decide. And then we need to consciously choose every morning who we're going to be, individually and as a community. So I wonder if uh, I could real quick get and just jump up if it moves. 10 volunteers. We're each going to read one sentence. So if you just line up. Oh, no, you, you're now <laughs> sentence one. Nice job, Jen. <laughs> Anybody else? We're just going to make a line. And all you're going to do is read the next sentence. Like, you're just going to read the next sentence. We're, we're not halfway there. We can do this. I believe in us. Anyone else? He's, he's, he's volunteering other people with you. You can do it. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll just get you in a line. Thank you. Okay, two more. Come on down here. Asana, come here. When I know you by name. Okay. So, when we read this, we're going to do something different again, culturally, than we normally do. We're like, listen to this and think, is this who we are? Like, who are we, right? Not followers, we're leaders, we're creating a new community, who are we? So we're gonna just read one sentence at a time. We'll go all the way down so we can start with the first sentence. We are committed to the prosperity of all, recognizing that the welfare of individuals rests in the welfare of society at large. They are loyal citizens who eschew partisanship and a contest for worldly power. Instead, they are focused on transcending differences, harmonizing perspectives, and promoting the use of consultation for making decisions. They emphasize qualities and attitudes such as trustworthiness, cooperation, forbearance, and are building blocks of a stable social order. They champion rationality and science as essential. For human progress. They advocate tolerance and understanding, and with inherent oneness of humanity uppermost in their minds, they view everyone as a potential partner to collaborate with, and they strive to foster fellow feeling, even among groups who may traditionally have been hostile to one another. They are conscious of how the forces of materialism are at work around them, and their eyes are wide open to the many injustices that persist in the world, yet they are equally clear-sighted about the creative power of unity and humanity's capacity for altruism. They see the power that true religion possesses to transform hearts and overcome the classes, and so this confidence and watch being neighbor to cultivate the conditions in which progress can occur. They share their beliefs liberally with others, remaining respectful of the freedom of conscience of every soul, and they never impose their own standards on anyone. And while they would not pretend to have discovered all the answers, they are clear about what they have learned and what they still need to learn. Thank you. So you can keep that or I'll take it back. Uh, 
So in the Baha'i Faith, we have an international body called the Universal House of Justice, and they wrote this in the letters, paragraph three, that was written to us a few months ago. And it moves me, I read it often, because I need a reminder of who we truly are. This is who I believe that humanity truly is already, but there's all this dust that's been put on top of us, and all this dirt. How can we shake that off? And allow other people some glimpses of spaces where they also can just be their, their true self, where we connect with each other. So in this work, I often think sometimes uh, of myself as a gardener. I have a garden, and uh, I love to garden. So there's a quote that I'll share from this book uh, called The Tablets of the Divine Pen. God says the glory in the glorious Quran, the soil was black and dry. Then we caused the rain to descend upon it, and immediately it became green, verdant, and every kind of plant sprouted up luxuriantly. In other words, he says the earth is black, but when spring showers descend upon that black soil, it's thickened, and variegated flowers are pushed forth. This means the soul of humanity belonging to the world of nature are black like the soil. But when the heavenly outpourings descend and the radiant effulgences appear, the hearts are resuscitated and liberated from the darkness of nature and the flowers of divine mysteries grow and become luxuriant. Consequently, man must become the cause of illumination of the world of humanity and propagate the teachings revealed by the sacred books. Because the ground is rich, the rain of divine outpouring is descending, now you must become heavenly farmers and scatter pure seeds in this prepared soil. The harvest of every other seed is limited, but the bounty and blessings of the seed of the divine teachings are unlimited. <laughs> Throughout the coming centuries and cycles, many harvests will be gathered. Consider the work of the former generations. So I hope today we plant some good seeds. The soil looks good, y'all. Just look <laughs> Soil looks good. Soil looks ready. And if you're in Florida, you know that's half the body. You got to get the soil ready. It can't be sandy and gross. And then you got to plant the seeds. You got to be patient. Some of them will grow. Some of them won't grow. And some of them will be eaten by squirrels. I'm just say it. My just my house. Wait 10 years for one pineapple and then a squirrel comes. <laughs> and I'm like, well, that wasn't meant to be my pineapple. So this is, you know, with this sense of commitment, well, at the same time, this balance of detachment. We do this work. We learn from each other. We talk with each other. So blessed to be in this space with you. And because we're integrating the arts and everything we do, I will end with a song. Um, because this is a song that I recently went to a gathering of 50 uh, youth in Atlanta. And these 50 youth are working with 11 to 15 year olds in their neighborhoods, trying to have them find out what the issues of their neighborhood are and fix them. And their, their plan is that we're not waiting for the government. We're not waiting for the adults. We don't trust them. We don't trust the current systems to do this right. We're going to rise up and figure out what we can do. And it's a very interesting thing because we as society have decided that they're passive, that they don't have answers, that they play video games, that they don't care. And I call nah on that. That's not true. Because I know because I've worked in my own community with 12 to 15 year olds, and they're in this space where they care a lot. So I was with 50 of them in one space, which was super loud and awesome. <laughs> and they asked them to go and to write a song together. Uh, and again, in society, we're like, oh, we don't know how to write a song. We don't know. We don't know. No. no, they didn't even, there was no hesitation. A 14-year-old got up and said, I know how to play the piano. What if we started with this? And then another person said, what if we added this? What if we added that? What I think I find from the Baha'i teachings in our community and the way we spread them is that the simple is profound. If we apply this paragraph, if we apply this one word, that I'm, this sentence that I'm going to say now, the impact is profound. It is not that complicated what we've been asked to do. We just have to believe it and we have to try it. We have to start moving. So this is what they say, which uh, has become my mantra. Whenever I feel overwhelmed or tired, I remember. When you call on the mercy of God waiting to reinforce you, your strength will be tenfold. Come on, Carlos, let me out. Give me some drums. Give me some drums. When you call on, that's it. The mercy of God waiting to reinforce you, your strength will be tenfold. When you call on the mercy of God waiting to reinforce you, your strength Your 
facilitators so everybody can see the facilitators and Maria I'm going to ask you to be the first one to um, raise your hand to show because you know where that that last yes. room is I don't know where that is so just so everybody knows we're going to be doing this five times throughout the conference with each of these five themes so we just did this all together in the large group and then after each large group we're going to have a small group breakout so that's what we're going to do right now and we spent a while thinking about how to get us into these smaller groups. We want basically we're gonna have four groups with more or less the same amount of people in each one. So we have to count off one, two, three, four, but uh, we'll go by rows. So given that this 